Welcome to the Rider Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. That's me. And Larry Correa. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Today's episode, Michael A. Rothman. Expose, round two. Yeah, and, and uh, there, there's politics involved. And, and, and not the kind of politics we're used to, right, left, or whatever. It, it's more about, you know, like, for instance, everyone outside of China is good with the ISBN mechanism of how to track books and stuff like that. China has their own mechanism. Okay, this, this episode is running along, but yeah. I love this story. Yeah. Um, and I have to share this story about foreign translations, going back to the dawn of it. And there was a horror author by the name of Graham Joyce, British horror author. Yeah. Great, great guy. I met him. I got to meet him once and got to dinner with him before he passed away. He was a ter- man, terrific author. Too yeah. scary. Hilarious guy. I mean, he's funny. I was there in America when he was introduced to the margarita. He'd never seen a margarita before. Drank like four of them. The guy was awesome. And um, I'm not even a drinker. I was a designated yeah. driver for a group of guys uh, at a writing thing. And so he's telling me the story. So it was after the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, he's in London. He gets a call from this Russian woman who wants to meet him at a pub. And because they have a new Russian publishing house. That's just opened up and they want to buy his foreign translation rights to sell his stories in Russian. So he goes to the pub and this is, keep on, this is right after the fall of the Soviet Union. So it's Wild West. And this, uh, there's two big Russian dudes and this beautiful woman that speaks English and Russian. She's a translator. And she's talking. I'll say like they can say, Mr. Boris is the guy's name. And he looks like a Mr. Boris. And Mr. Boris would like to make you an offer for your books. And he reaches under the table and he pulls out, Boris pulls out a briefcase. Mm-hmm. And he puts the briefcase down and he turns around and opens it up and it's full of cash. Yeah. Just full of British pounds in stacks, rubber banded. And he's like, this is your one-time offer for the rights. And then Mr. Boris goes, no, no, no. says something in Russian. And she goes, also, Mr. Boris says, if you choose not to accept this offer, you need to be aware there's a great many photocopiers in Russia. <laughs> 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 that was yeah. his Russian uh, board. And he's like, so you looked at this briefcase full of cash. He's like, all right, then. <laughs> I guess we got a deal. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, all of this, though, the, I, and, and I want to tie this back to, to kind of tie off our episode. And that's the, the idea of doing the translation, but for audio purposes. Right. And you, I mean, you and I were talking about this just two nights ago. It is, man, that is not a game for the weak of heart. No, no. And, and, and well, one of the biggest difficulties is, um, and, and I learned this the hard way. Um, yeah, you know, one, the, when you start shopping around for uh, narration in foreign languages, you'll realize that the English narrators are cheap. <laughs> oh. Uh, um, and and yeah, especially if you're looking for really good quality ones. And and here here was my mistake number one. So I went with you know. So I knew a German guy that I trusted. Eh, I still trust him, but you know you know taste is not always universal. Um, and so yeah, and to give put relative amounts here, we're talking. So I, I said I I, I pay roughly. Three hundred dollars per finished hour for audiobooks uh, to the narrator. Um, you know, so this guy was four hundred. Okay, yeah, incremental, but okay. Um, and, I, and I figured, okay, and, and and the guy had given me some samples of stuff, and I had my German guy look at it, and he's like, "Yeah, he sounds really good." And I'm like, "Okay, let's go for it." You know, so I had him do like a series of like four books or whatever. You know. And you can imagine the expense that was associated with that. And let's just say look, those four books are still the way they are, but the the audible ratings are not nearly what they should be. Um, mm. beca- and all the comments are the same. You know, it's like you know the guy overacts and this and that. Yeah, you know, things that aren't necessarily having to do with the quality of the voice, the mm. timbre of the voice, but. How, you know, I mean, you're essentially reading a play of some kind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Depending and, on your nature, your narrator, you, you, a lot of times, like like Bronson Pinchot does Hard Magic. It's like, it's like a one man audio play. Right. Right. And, uh, but 
but that guy, I don't know what Audible pays him per hour, but I'm sure it's astronomical. Right. I mean, the guy, the guy upstaged Eddie Murphy at the pinnacle of Eddie Murphy's career. I mean, right. he's a freaking powerhouse right. actor. And so he 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 acts the crap out of it. And I had people like, well, he gets a little over dramatic in these parts. But but he was having fun and it comes through. And the guy's sure. a, you know, such a fantastic actor. But if you got a bad actor oh, doing right. that, gosh, oh right. my gosh. Like oh, the yeah. guy, my guy who read Residue for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Not the second time, but the Not first the second time. time. The second time is yeah. great. Well, second Residue, time you got a you got Residue now yeah. on audio. Oh yeah, hey guys. I oh, was speaking of which Steve's right. book residue is in audio, and also since we got both these guys here, uh, you guys have written three books, or you've written two books together so far, yeah. with a two, third one yeah. in the pipeline. Yeah, yeah, two books are out right now: New Arcadia and Operation Thrall. Those right. are both out. Yep. And then uh, the third one, Vatican Files, is due for March. Yes, March. Yes. Very cool. So, yeah. yeah. All of which are in audio. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> and, and that's the gotcha. Is, you know, so I, I, lesson learned, there was a lot of expense and I wasn't about to go redo it. Um, you know, because, you know, now, uh, so eh, I ended up doing a lot of narration in German more, more as a, okay, let's see if I can make a go of it and see if I can, yeah, because not very few Indies. I, I don't know of any others, so, but I assume there's some, but I, I don't know of any other Indies who've done who've really cracked in a serious way more than onesie twosie. I, I've done like 20 books in, um, you know, literal 20 books uh, in audio and German. And uh, to see what, what does the market tolerate? And what is the German audiobook market like? I have no idea. So that's the thing is that that was what my, uh, what I was testing just to see. Yeah. You know, and, and so the, the, um, the narrator that I use most recently, and I'm not doing more right now. Um, you know, uh, you know, let's just say I was paying, I forget the exact number, but it was, it was, it was something like 700 to $900 per finished hour. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. So it's an expense. Now this guy was like the guy who, you know, yeah. So I, I wanted to avoid my first mistake where I'm going, all right, the $400 guy, he was good. He, he done plays. He was this, he was that. He did commercials, you know, whatever. Um, this guy was like the voice, the German voice of George Clooney in movies and this and that. Yeah, so he, he, he was an actor, you know, professional. And he pay and he charged professional prices. <laughs> well, yeah. So you're yeah. Let's going back. We we're talking about earlier about the SAG actors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who was it we knew who got Giancarlo Esposito to narrate his audiobook? Wasn't that? Um, um, was that Jonathan Brazy? I think it was Jonathan Brazy. Yeah, had Giancarlo Esposito. Right. I can't even imagine yeah. what that cost. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. he said it was a lot. Well, it's like it's like hi, I'm the guy from Breaking Bad. Yeah. It was. <laughs> He's yeah. like, okay, here's yeah. your. St- Here's your briefcase full of money. Right. right. <laughs> well, and he got paid all that. Yeah. And from what I understand, it took, I'm not sure that they broke even. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, and that's the gotcha. And that's one of the reasons why I don't, um, you know, I, I've, I've stopped doing the audio on, on new series or, you know, con- continuation. Because, you know, for, for me, I, what I was seeing was uh, I'm actually relatively fine from an investment point of view is seeing my money back in a year or so give or take i mean and and that's you know i guess for the listening audience really should be a thing to keep in mind you're not going to make your money back next month yeah you know you need to plan in your head that you know hopefully if you're doing well you're going to make your money back within the year or so you know that, that, that should be your goal or you know what you shoot for um and, and you know realistically I wasn't seeing the traffic in the audiobook sales, you know, with an unquestionable quality guy. And, and I had, you know, an, an audio, yeah, I had an audio team essentially, you know, you know, because the same copy edits and stuff like that, that have to happen on narration. I can't do that. I'm not, you know, a German speaker. So, yeah. So all that stuff, it was professionally done, you know, top notch and yeah probably take two plus years to make my money back Ooh. so yeah so and i'm like you know from an investment point of view it's okay but you know what that that's a lot of money and it's better spent expanding elsewhere yeah i was yeah. gonna say this is this is pretty resource intensive and yeah. i think for a lot of people who are if you're indie author and you're you know financing everything out of your own pocket 
uh, that's opportunity cost. You know, that's yeah. You, yeah. you could use that money. Yeah, it's elsewhere. Spain, further in Spain or further in some other language that I'm not exploring yet. Yeah. You know, right. Uh, versus hoping to see my money in two years. And, and, and that's always a gamble. Maybe you'll never see your money back. I mean, you have to imagine that anything you spend ever is, you know, could be down the toilet. Yeah, you know, I think this was definitely it's something that people could explore uh, if if they are doing well enough that they're interested yeah. in getting those underroads. But if, if you're just getting by in America and making a little bit of money and having right. some fun money right. on the side, probably not worth it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh -huh. y y you need to think about the money you spend on investing in your business as money you're okay seeing not come back. And, you know, it's kind of like when you come to Vegas and you're gamble, you better be gambling only money you, you're you okay with losing. Oh, and to specify, so yeah. say foreign translation, way less yeah. costly, yeah. Yeah. way more opportunity for profit yes. faster. Right. Foreign audiobook, yeah. much more costly, much yeah. more risky. Yeah, at least that's been my experience that people may find themselves experiencing it differently but i i've I, i've i've got a lot of data points that point me in that direction at this point so yeah, yeah. that's what we were excited to have you on the show talk about this stuff because people are asking these questions i'm out of date yeah. and my information secondhand like because i was self-published 15 years ago right in, it's a different era yeah and the, the terms of how much this industry has changed my knowledge of that world is basically utterly useless right that entire world is like, it might as well be the dinosaurs. Right. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I put it on a phonograph and sent it to Thomas Edison. It is that old. Right. And uh, so it's, it amazes me, though, how much this has changed. We're here at 20 Books in Las Vegas, and we're talking to all these different authors. And it, 20 Books really caters to independent authors right. and people doing their own way. And uh, I've been here for three years, and, and I know me and you uh, have gone to – meetings here of like the um what do you call it? the mastermind the, I think. the yeah, illuminati yeah, it's yeah, the uh, yeah, yeah. like the, the the really successful authors right. and i i like snuck my way in as like token <laughs> trad pub guy like snuck in yeah. you know but it's just actually really interesting to see how creative people are in yeah. this business because there's never they're not beholden by tradition they're not be they're not stuck by like the traditional publishing house that says we're going to do it this way we've always done it this way this is our gentleman's agreement right no one cares that no. everybody just does whatever they can it's yeah. really interesting yeah and, and the thing is that there's so much i mean you peel the onion and i won't even really touch on it, but but as an example of just so many complicated things that you can worry about as an indie you know and, and i'll give one simple example and call it call it done on that it is you know like when you're doing advertising and and you think, okay, I'm going to advertise to Europe because, yeah, I've been focused on U.S. I'll advertise to Europe. And, like, one of the things I've learned is, is, like, when I do a Facebook ad, as an example, you know, and I'm not recommending or saying bad, good, or otherwise. But, you know, you know let's say you, you advertise to Facebook. And Facebook is, it has a very good, yeah, if you want to target readers within six miles of Wimbledon, you can. It's, it's kind of amazing in that respect. But... You know, I made a mistake one time of going ahead and saying, all right, well, let me just target Europe. You know, you know it seems like, I mean, you know, there's a lot of English speakers that I'm not going to necessarily target Hungary, you know, for the English speakers there. But, you know, you know but let's go Europe and it's an English book. You know, and, and it seemed to make sense in my head at the time. And I suddenly saw this tremendous number of clicks, very cheap clicks, like, I mean, normally, let's imagine that the normal price that you pay for a click on an ad is 10 cents. I was seeing all these one penny, two penny clicks. I'm like, this is awesome. And then, you know, after the data, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a data guy. So after, you, after a couple of days of seeing these clicks and seeing nothing happening on the other end, going, I'm getting lots of clicks for, yeah, where, where are these clicks coming from? And they're all coming from like Eastern Europe areas that I'm like, I have no idea what's going on, but they're dirt cheap clicks, but I don't think there's people behind them. I mean, there's, they're bots. There are people who just click on everything they see. I, I don't, I don't understand it. So, you know, that's an example of, okay, key learning. Don't ever target all of Europe, you know, target England, you know, target, you know, you know, be specific about what you're targeting because a click, yeah, just because someone clicks on it 
doesn't mean anything. You want them to buy. All right, so this episode's already turned into a yeah. two-parter, so we can just keep yeah. going. Yeah. Um, we'll just, yeah. yeah. Corey Monroe's life has been filled with strange and wondrous things. Time and time again, she's found herself at the eye of the storm and done everything in her power to keep everyone safe. In the series finale, the fate of all the realms, including Earth, rests on her shoulders. All her offerings have been spent. Will she make the ultimate sacrifice to save those she loves? Join her journey as she goes from Barista to Merlin to the Herald of Magic in the completed Twisted Luck series by Mel Todd. Available everywhere on audio or exclusively on Amazon in ebook. Yeah. Okay, I'm actually really curious on this too, on, on, on your advertising. Yeah. And your targeted advertising, kind of what's your philosophy on that? Because like I said, you, you've, you've single-handedly pushed some of your stuff onto national bestseller lists, yeah. which is something yeah. that publishing houses fail to do right. all the time. Right. Um, what is your advertising philosophy? Like, how, like how, do sure. you, how do you come at this? All right. So, so for me, it, you know, I think like it's the same philosophy as everyone else is make money. You know, ultimately, it doesn't matter, you know, if, if you're losing money on the marketing campaign, you're wasting your, your, your own time and, and money. Um, so I'll use an example. You know, like what, if I'm going to go do a, let's say, a, a USA Today run. Yeah, and, and for those that don't know, um, you know, typically the way the way you get on any of these bestseller lists, and, and I use USA Today specifically because they're the most honest about the accounting with regards to sales. Oh you yeah, because the New York Times. Yeah, the, yeah, you might as well just throw money into the wind. It's like R- yeah, right. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, a solid. They account. either like you or they don't. Yeah. I, like one one of the times I hit USA Today and, and you know I, I I knew some of the people who were actually uh, hit New York Times for the same week and I had sold thirteen thousand units of whichever book it was um, that week and, and 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 you know for those that don't know the bestseller lists are are based on velocity of sales so it doesn't matter how many books you sold that year it's about from this period to this period, usually a week, um, it's usually Sunday, you know, Monday to Sunday or whatever. Um, how many books have you sold in, you know, for USA Today, it's within the US. Um, you know, England sales don't matter. Yeah, you know, it's within the US. Um, and they gather their data from the various major vendors. Uh, you know, and, and actually USA Today is pretty good about listing where they gather the data from. Um, and yeah, like, so like I, Ingram, Baker, and Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the wholesalers, and yeah, you know, the Barnes and Noble, and Kobo, and Google, and iTunes, and whatever. Yeah. Um, New York Times pulls it out of their butt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's mo- <laughs> exactly to that point. You know, so I, I had sold thirteen thousand and change in the U.S. that week during that marketing campaign. Um, and you don't do these marketing campaigns to make money, really. Um, you know, th- th- there's never a time really for me that I made money immediately on that. Uh, it was more a case of, you know, at the time I was shooting for, um, getting on the USA Today. I, I wanted the moniker. Yeah. You know, it was an ego thing for me. Yeah. You know, certainly uh, uh, upfront, you know, yeah, uh, it's nice to have the moniker. Um, but I, I'd sold 13,000. And I knew some people who were on the New York Times, and um, and, and there's ways to you know if you, if you see the list of that are on the New York Times, you, you can at least get get pretty reasonable idea of how many books those sold. Yeah, Nielsen um, book scan you exactly get you the book, book, book scan a good chunk of them, like eighty five percent give or take yeah. of, of what their sales were. I, you know, if I believe the numbers that I had at that time, I should have hit like number three or number four on the New York Times. Um, obviously, I didn't show any, show up anywhere. Um, and, and, and that's why, you know, for me, marketing campaign on USA Today is really about, um, a couple of things. Uh, it's a lot of pre-planning. Um, you need to line up, you know, wh- whatever marketing you're going to do and, and, and 
this kind of thing takes money. So, all right. So, uh, I'm I'm actually one of the crazy. I, I'm the only crazy indie guy that I know um, that um, has hit the USA Today on a single book. Most people who have hit USA Today in uh, that are indie tend to do it as a collaboration effort amongst let's say 20 authors. Oh yeah, I've seen yeah. that. I've seen that. So you at, can, they can then declare I'm a, I'm a, at, exactly. Put yeah. down, they can put down truthfully that they're a bestseller, but it was a, it was a bundle. Right. Yeah. So, so it's kind of, you know, I you lost imagine. the number one spot once and I was telling you about this yeah. and I was, it was on something and uh, I think it was on Amazon and I was like number two. Right. And I was like, well, what am I losing to? Let me go look. And it's number one was like 10 books for 99 cents. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and usually I would say the, the lion's share of the folks that do this, I think the max was you could bundle 20 people oh on a gosh. single book. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, it's, <laughs> so, so, so and, it, and it makes sense from a mechanism point of view because imagine you got 20, you know, the, the, the reader is going to get a book for 99 cents, let's say. Um, great, great deal. Okay. You know, 20 books for 99 cents. Okay. That's, that's nice. And then imagine you've got 20 authors who are all sh pushing, marketing, doing, yeah, pulling whatever levers they have. They're all emailing all their the fans. Same thing. They're all, they, they all got a separate uh, email list, yes. newsletter, whatever it may right. be, website. Right. They're all flogging it. Yep. So, so it's 20 times the flogging exactly. of one person. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I didn't know people were doing that until I already done the three. Yeah. After this number three. This seems super cheesy to me. It, 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 but I understand a, why they do it. Yeah, I, I, I don't like it, but I understand. It. I get it because, yeah. like, because the main thing for you guys out there to realize about being a bestseller of whatever your bestseller of is once you've made that list, they can't really take it from you, and then yeah. you get to put it on your name. Yeah. Okay, so like I use here's the thing: I hate the New York Times. Yeah. I hate it. I think it's evil. I think yeah. it's. It's, 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 it goes back, it's a, it's a newspaper that supports the genocide of various nations and yeah. wins Pulitzer's for it. Right. The New York Times is not fit for crap. And I can tell you guys stories about yeah. that. They tried to buy an op-ed from me one time and I told them to go to hell. Yeah. And they asked me, like, why? Yeah. They tried to buy a, a blog post from me. Right. And I, I said, no. And they're like, why? well, may I ask why? Because we're, you know, we're very respected and they pay, their op-eds actually pay really good. Right. And I said, I have no respect for your publication from your reporting to your bestseller list. And I do not want my name associated with you anymore. So right. bye. But, but here's the kicker. I still say I, on my bio, I'll put NYT bestseller. Why do I do that? Because to low information people, like regular people, normal yeah. people who don't keep up on this stuff, right. who don't know how crappy and rigged the system is, yeah. it means something. They still think it means something. Yeah. So, so anyone listening to this makes me pod, sound cool. Yeah. I mean, any, anyone listening to this podcast is not what I would call the normal purchaser off Amazon. Right. Uh, you know, you, you know more than most and, and most people, you know, have ingrained in their heads certain things that are like, you know, that lend credibility, um, whether it does or not is a material. In their heads, you know, they see New York Times, they see USA Today or Wall Street Journal, whatever. It's an indicating, it's indicating for them goodness, you know. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It, it's um, it's a psychological impact. Absolutely. What it is. You guys Absolutely. ever watch like low, because I, I watch a lot of low budget movies. Yeah. And uh, there's like a certain kind of low budget horror movies that will always put up like the, like preview all the little awards it's won yeah around like the title and it's all stuff like it's like the toronto january 4th film festival of you know 14th street or whatever it may be it's like esoteric little goofy awards it doesn't matter because people put up all those awards to the audience they say oh this is a this is a art movie this is a this is a good movie right you right, know right so i put bestseller to, to normies, let's, for lack of a better term, yeah. people who don't listen to the writer dojo, right? They're like, oh, it's an, it must be good, right? Right. You know, it, it's it's not, but for marketing potential, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and the same thing with Amazon, the orange tags, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. 
you see, we've all seen that. Somebody's like, I'm a number one bestseller on Amazon. Right. And it was like for left hand, you know, I'm number one in left handed Latvian cookbooks. Uh, right. <laughs> and, and and to achieve that, you had to have sold one. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was number one in psychic thrillers. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Like, like, that's yeah. a genre? It is now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. okay. It was. Uh, yeah. A well, the thing that yeah. irks me is I used to always sit number one in urban fantasy. But then Amazon, the way they changed their... It's funny because they have these like hyper tiny little genres. But for urban fantasy, they went ahead and took all the paranormal romance yeah. and stuck it back into urban fantasy. Yeah. I'm all of a sudden... so. And, and for you guys that don't realize, um, we're, you know, we're sci-fi fantasy guys here. Uh, romance makes us all look like punks. I oh, mean, yeah. They yeah. sell... Oh, there yeah, are, but, there yeah. are romance authors here at 20 Books at this conference who have sold... A hundred times what I've heard, what I've yeah. sold, I have never heard their names because they're yeah. not a big deal in romance. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no. It, it, it's, it's actually kind of shocking. Now, now, now I, I, for, for the audience, I, I, I do not want to leave them an impression that the, that the bundling of 20 authors, even though I completely understand why someone would do it, but I want to give kind of a reality check to that as well. Um, you know, so... Th and I'll, I'll ask the audience to think about it this way. Um, when you have 20 books that are all bundled together, so, someone paid, someone at least paid money, you know, to, to get the bundle of 20 books. So they've invested a dollar. Now, imagine you as the author, you know, your goal really is the same one as I had. It's an ego goal. You want that, that moniker. And that's great. No, that's fine. I, that's why I did it. Um, you know, I'll admit that. Now, the benefit I gained from it was that book had legitimately 13,000 sales. I will probably have 13,000 reads out of that. People will read my book. If they liked it, they'll go maybe buy some of my other books. So that's why I said it's like my immediate cost on the marketing thing may have been in the red. You know, it certainly was in the red. But in the long term, I probably gained a whole bunch of readers that I wouldn't have otherwise gained through, you know, normal organic means. I, 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 I pushed hard to get, you know, to reach out to nooks and crannies I normally don't reach out to, to get people to read my book. And so, so there, there is that benefit. Now, uh, let's, let's take the example with the 20 people bundled together. Imagine, you know, obviously in that bundle, a book has to go first. And it probably won't be yours. One out of 20 chance. Yeah, your, your book won't be the first physical book in that ebook. So imagine from a reader's perspective, you know, and there's no guarantee on quality on any of this stuff. You know, quality is very subjective. Um, but imagine that if the reader reads that first book and is like, oh, that was pretty good. I, I enjoyed that. Read book number two. Oh, I hated that. And book number three was like, eh, you know. They may never get to book four. And what if you were book 16? So you, you may have gotten a lot of purchases, quote unquote, but you may have gotten almost no readers. Yeah, your conversion rate on that, the chances of you having a high conversion rate on that, of them seeing your book and then going on to the, to the subsequent one is way lower, just, just right. in terms of statistics. There's, right. there's also a psychological thing. And I, 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 it's been, you know, 30 years since I went to, or 25 years since I took a marketing class in college. But there was a psychological term for something about perceived value for the customer or how you price stuff. Because right. um, I see this all the time, people talking about, you get these really cheap people will, come, will cry on an Amazon review. It's like, how come your ebook is six ninety nine when I can get a 99 cent? Like, go buy it. My my ebook is six ninety nine or eight ninety nine when it comes out because I sell them at that. Right. Because people because my name has a brand attached to it that people are like I will spend eight ninety nine for a Larry Korea ebook. Right. Which is great because I'm getting a percentage of that. Right. Yeah. Right. But 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 was like ninety nine cents. You know, it's a perception of value. It's kind of like a lot of writers we worry about piracy. We, yeah. Because well, I mean we don't like people stealing our crap. Right. But what we found with like people who like pirate all the music. Yeah. They they don't actually listen to a hundred thousand songs. Yeah. They just like being able to say, I have a hundred thousand songs. Right. Right. And they they steal it all. So the same thing with pirated books. They don't actually read the books. Right. They just I mean, some people do, but most of them just go out and they get a hundred thousand books to say, Oh wow, I I, right. I have a thing of perceived value. Right. Right. And, and, and the thing is, is with you know, my like my indie experience on the pricing, you know, is is, is 
I think, interesting in as much as when I first started indie, I, I think my my books were like at four ninety nine, and you know, and, and now all my books are at six ninety nine, and and I I think I had the five ninety nine pit stop in the in the middle, and eventually went to six ninety nine. Each and every, I mean, you know, the, the paranoia that most people will have is if I increase the price, my sales will go down, blah, blah. I never experienced any of that. In fact, you know, my sales have, you know, have, you know, over time been going up, up, up. Yeah, because people think about it like it's Econ 101 with a supply and demand curve. Yeah. You know exactly. what I'm saying? But it's not. People forget that's like the basic lowest la- level of consumer, you know, setting value. Right. Is a supply and demand curve because there's a perceived value of the item, right. and it's like one of those. It's like it's like a ninety nine cent hamburger versus a twenty cent twenty dollar hamburger. As a consumer, you're gonna you're gonna assume the ninety nine cent hamburger is like a cheap piece of crap. Like you're gonna get mass produced cheap piece of crap. Right. Twenty dollar hamburger that better be a freaking good hamburger. Right. And you have it built up in your head that that is a luxury hamburger. Absolutely. Yeah. And so so if you have a brand. Then setting your price at that is not a big deal. Right. That said, I mean, I'm not a marketing guy, and I know they dick around all the time with the prices, moving them up and down, and having sales and whatnot. Because and, right. you do want to get the cheap people too. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Um, yeah. We, I mean, we, we were talking about marketing in, in general, and, and I would say, yeah, and a lot of people when they're thinking about marketing from a book perspective, I mean, there's so many layers to this onion, but you know, I mean, the, the biggest topics would be where where do I market? You know, like, uh, you know, what, what, what engine do I use to market to people? You know, obviously Facebook is, is a big one. Um, and then obviously Amazon as well. And, and, and so I, I'll say this much, um, one, and again, this is a key learning o- over time. Um, and it's interesting because I, a lot of times I'll, I'll have, I monitor everything. I'm a, yeah, again, the, the data guy. So you know, I find it very interesting that, you know, like I, I've set things up where I'll put a Facebook ad. So Facebook, I don't sell anything directly on Facebook as an example. You know, it's not a store. I point them, to, you know, when someone clicks on an, on an ad on Facebook, it lands them at the store. So, you know, it's not like a one-click shop there. You know, you got to land to the, you know, get to the store. So one of the things I've learned is, you know, because I, at times... I've done things where I've pointed the click to kind of an intermediary. I'm like, all right, you know, you know, like on my website where I go, at least on my website, I know who, like, you know, when I send somebody to Amazon, I don't know what Amazon does with that information. You know, I, you know, how many clicks did they receive? What did the person do? Mm-hmm. And, and there's actually ways nowadays to do that. But one of my point I'm making here is, you know, I learned very quickly that, when I sent somebody to a website that I could monitor what the what the clicker did, you know, or clicky, clicker, clicky, whatever, um, what did they do? I was like, all right, let's imagine I had a hundred clicks on a Facebook ad, you know, so my website received a hundred clicks. Great, math ma- matches, so we're good there. And and that in that. Um, my website basically gave them a choice saying, hey, if you prefer, Am-, you know, this is when I was wide distribution where I was selling not just Amazon, but, you know, Barnes and Noble and Kobo and everywhere else. So I gave them a pick list of, you know, because you can't do that on a Facebook ad. You go, hey, if you're a Barnes and Noble, click here. You know, yeah, you, you don't have that option. So I, I'd send them to a pick list basically and say, hey, wh- which is your preferred retailer? And click on that and it'll land you where you want to go. So what I learned was, 100 clicks were received and landed on the pick list. Only about a third of those ended up picking anything. They're like, eh, I'm done. So you lost like two thirds of your audience by just one click of separation. Just hitting that speed bump. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's so, crazy. Yeah. So, so which, which kind of lends to the, you know, you know, measuring this kind of data is really key. Um, and, even though fa- Facebook has some really strong things going for it, you know, targeting is one thing I mentioned. It's like if, if I want to target people between 18 and 23, you know, who like boxing, okay, I can do that, you know, um, in specific geos, whatever. It's great for that. Um, what, it, what it's not good at 
is this multiple click problem. <laughs> you know, I'm, I lose efficiency. And, and what I've, you know, recently am, you know, and so the alternative, and I know a lot of people who do Facebook ads and, and they do it reasonably well and, and, and they, they swear by it. And, and, and I understand. And I have reasons why I, I would use Facebook in some very specific situations, but I actually prefer actually doing marketing on the storefront itself. And Amazon provides its own way. You know, like if you ever see sponsored ads on the storefront where a book is, that's paid advertising. So, and authors would go ahead and just what, what they do on Facebook, they would do that on Amazon. It's interesting too, because like like I don't know how that works, but I've seen oftentimes where I'll search my own name, yes. and it'll be like suggested for you exactly. based upon this. Yes, and and um, and a lot of times I even recognize who the people are, and it's usually an indie author I know yeah. who does something similar to me. And they may be targeting you, going, "Hey, anybody who looks for Larry Korea, yeah, show my book." I, that's what I'm guessing on some yeah. of these guys. Mm -hmm. Like this guy specifically put in is like people searching for Larry Korea novels. Please show him right my stuff, right? Which is smart. Yeah. No, no. It, How much does that cost? Um, you, you, you're generally paying per click. Um, and, and, all right. So, so, so here's, a, here's another huge difference. Facebook and Amazon. I, I like Amazon for two reasons. It's the click problem. It's the dilution of your clicks you know, across that. You know, yeah, they're dicking around on Amazon. They're there to spend money. Yeah, right, right. You're already at, you know, you, you're dealing with someone who's at the cash register. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, right. and, and you want to deal with those people. Um, You're yeah, there to Facebook, buy something else. It's like when you grab the Kit Kat at the cash register on the way out. Yeah. Exactly. You know, which you I know, did people, right before I came here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I was buying allergy medicine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The people on Facebook, they're around. They're they're not usually thinking to buy a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or they're thinking of doing it. They're, they're trying to scroll past your ad and they click on your ad. That's yeah. why you hit yeah. that speed bump. Is yes. like that two thirds is like, what am I doing? Right. I was doing something else. Why am I yes, here? Exactly. Exactly. And, and and that's where you know it comes down to an efficiency thing. But here's the gotcha with Amazon or Facebook ads. You can say, all right, I want to set a, a campaign budget. I, I, I want to set up a you know a marketing ad. I'll I'll pay, I'll pay 100 bucks uh, for that day. Let's say. Yeah, you know, I'm just making numbers up. Facebook will gladly spend your hundred dollars, and you you have no guarantee of efficiency or not. You can say, I want to spend a million dollars. They'll eat that money in that day. I mean, you know, it's like, I don't know a million, but I, I know a thousand. They'll spend, they'll easily spend a thousand dollars in a day. No problem. Uh, what a lot of indies actually report when they're using Amazon is um, I can't get Amazon to spend my money, <laughs> you know, because Amazon has a, you know, I'm actually giving a pretty long talk on, on this topic, but yeah. Uh, you know, they have an algorithm. They, they, Amazon's goal is to make their customers happy. And, and ultimately, people who visit Amazon, they want to show them in their sponsored ads things that they think will, they'll actually buy because they only make money if they sell something. So Amazon has the same motivation as any of the authors, even though you know, a lot of people see it as a big, bad you know, co corporation. <laughs> Ultimately, their goal is the same as any of ours. Is they want to sell something because that's the only way they make money, other than sponsored ads. But yeah, but yeah, they want to make money, and they'll make money only if they're actually showing, or they're more likely to make money if they're showing stuff that you know. If Larry Korea is online, I'm not going to show him you know these books on knitting. Yeah, it probably isn't going. to to get a click or a, a sale. Yeah, because Amazon, shown, whereas Facebook shows me the dumbest crap imaginable because it's right. like terrible. Ad. Oh, it shows yeah. you whatever someone around you was talking about yeah. that day. Yeah. Well, and you also too, I mean? for me as a gun guy, it shows me like really trash tier holsters that just make me angry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is that especially if you've bought stuff from Amazon before or if, especially books, you, Amazon's not too bad about figuring out stuff that is at least in your ballpark of Curiosity. You may not necessarily click on sponsored ads as a general rule. You have, you know, but they're not that off. You know, it's not. It's not going to show you, you know, crocheting or you know, t-ball or whatever when you're not one of those people, um, which is it, it is good. And um, you know, and the gotcha is is that it's it's a more efficient mechanism, yeah, you know, in my experience. And, and 
And, and, and when I w- did any of the USA Today stuff, it was a combination of, yeah, because you're, you're literally, you're throwing everything at the wall, you know, to, to get numbers. So, um, you know, what, what you've got is a situation that is, okay, I'm going to go advertise everywhere I can to get as many sales as possible. And so I, I, I used Amazon, I used Facebook, I used something called BookBub. Um, and, which is a big thing, and um, yeah, and that's largely it. Um, yeah, it, yeah. There, there, there's a lot of yeah. The, the, this onion can be peeled for a very long time with the whole marketing session. On on that note, um, this is now our official longest episode ever. So I think we're going to break this into multiple parts. Yeah. Uh, and also, the guys we're playing D and D with just showed up. <laughs> <laughs> we do. So okay. So look, we're, we're, we're going to wrap up this basically two part episode right now. Um, thank you everyone for listening. We appreciate it. And, uh, Mike, thanks so much for taking. Yeah, that was awesome. Way thanks, longer no than I think we anticipated to, to spend some time with us. We appreciate it. Man. Sure. No problem. Uh, I hope you as the listeners have found it educational. Larry and I certainly did. We kept looking at each other in the episode going, wow, that's really cool. Huh. That's lost. Like I said, my, my knowledge is dated. So I was like really good stuff. Yeah. So um, this won't be the last time we have Mike on, obviously. Um, we'll, we'll kidnap him at some future day and force him to talk about numbers to us some more. Um, have him talk about thrillers, techno thrillers and stuff. Um, I sure. think that'd be fun too. Um, all right. Well, uh, thanks so much for listening. This is the Writer Dojo. We'll see you on the next one. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Korea. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Nivo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. Whereas Facebook shows me the dumbest crap imaginable.